Ice hockey is a cool sport, right? Even if you don't play, even if you don't follow a team, there's just something about this that's undeniably awesome. But despite this obvious awesomeness, hockey has never really been as popular as many other global sports. Sure, they love it up north, and if you grew up in a cold part of America, you probably have fans in your local bar, but it's always been the little brother to the sports with balls. And given the cost of making AAA games in 2023, that's kind of a problem. These days, annualized sports games are the norm, but that wasn't always the case. When Electronic Arts started making yearly sports titles in the early 90s, it had more to do with the lightning-fast design evolution of these games than it had to do with rosters. Today the studios that make these games have grown exponentially, but so too have the games, and with a market that now expects a new title every year. And since this year marks the 30th anniversary of NHL 94, I wanted to explore the design of this classic game and how games like NHL 94 laid the foundations of sports games for decades. So today we're going to talk about NHL 94, but to do that you sort of have to talk about NHL 95 and NHL PA 93 and EA Hockey. Look, we're going to have to talk about John Madden football too. And while we're at it, I'm going to talk to some of the folks working on the modern NHL games to explore the pros and cons of living in the shadow of a classic. It's kind of incredible it's taken us this long to do a documentary on a sports game. No offense, Rocket League. Uh, so it's probably just as well that we're doing it on arguably one of the best sports games ever made. Here I go. Here I go. <laughs> People have been through the code. So, you know, to ask about specific bugs and, you know, I mean, yeah, that's something that we should have caught, but it's like, have you ever had a bad day at, at work? You know, it's like, like, did you get asked about it 30 years later? Like, you know, there are different groups uh, building sports games. And so uh, Don Traeger's group was building basketball and golf and we were working on baseball and football and, uh, you know, the history of Madden was, you know, that, that, that Trip Hawkins was a big sports fan. He'd actually made a football game before he even joined Electronic Arts. So that was kind of his thing. And he'd went and signed Madden and they built a PC version of football. And it really pushed the envelope on football just to get 11 guys animating was really pushed the system. So it was pretty clunky and, you know, it definitely overreached the technology at the time. Um, even though it was pretty sophisticated as a, as a sim, it was kind of clunky and it didn't sell very well. And Rich Hillman kind of wanted to build a, a Genesis version of, of, of the game because the, you could do so much more with the Sega Genesis. So he wanted to build a football game from scratch that really, you know, was an EA football game and it was um, meant to be an arcade game. I was brought in because I was a big sports fan. I was also into computers and that was good enough. They couldn't find people who were sports fans and into games at the time, if you can actually believe that. So I was brought in to help produce the game. So I was an associate producer on the EA football game that we were building for the Sega Genesis. And it had nothing to do with John Madden at the time. It was meant to be the arcade game and I'm the associate producer and there were meant to be eight teams that were um, just made up teams. I was kind of like, I'm supposed to do all these detailed ratings for all the teams. I'm like, I'm going to model these after, uh, eight teams in real life. And, you know, and we'll call them San Francisco and Philadelphia and, you know, my favorite eight teams. And so we did that. And, uh, this is pretty realistic and everybody wants their team in. So we managed to get eight more teams in at the last minute, 16 teams. So we didn't even have all the, all the teams in the game 
We had just gone public in the last year and accounting came to us maybe like three weeks before we're due to final the game and said, uh, said, you know, we've got this huge balance that we paid John Madden um, as an advance and we're going to have to write it off. That looks really bad. But, you know, if we can attach it to your football game um, and give them a high enough royalty rate, then it'll chew it up and we don't need to write it off at all. And, you know, we can push it forward and that'll help the quarter out. So he said, okay, we'll, we'll add John onto the game. Like, I don't think he's going to make a difference because, you know, video gamers don't really know John Madden. We did that. And, uh, and then, you know, we based our royalty rate off the 75,000 units that were projected and we sold 300,000 units. And then good luck trying to renegotiate with Madden to knock that rate down because his agent is like, oh, that's because you added John Madden onto the game. So, you know, we sort of just went with that and um, like we used Madden's plays. And so Madden in the original John Madden football got built in in the last three weeks. Football is a fairly popular sport, obviously, in the US, and I'm sure it is in Canada to a certain extent as well. Hockey seemed like it was a like a smaller fish to fry, maybe, within the world of sports games. When did the idea of doing the hockey one sort of come come around, you know? Yeah, so we, uh, we got the first football game out. It shipped, like, almost a year early because, uh, you know, I mean, for competitive reasons. So we really didn't get to finish the the design that we had in mind until Madden 92. It ended up taking uh, Jim Simmons six months to really program the game. So we felt we had some time between when he needed to start on Madden 92 and, uh, and when we finished Madden, which by the way, he also knocked out Joe Montana football for Sega in that time period. That's a whole different story. But, uh, but basically, uh, the sports that were kind of open to us because basketball and uh, golf and baseball and football were already already taken. Rich Hillman and I were big hockey fans, so that was like just a total natural. We're gonna do do hockey. I put a proposal forward to let's we should really do soccer as well, and that was a tough sell if you can believe it. That took about a year to to really make the the sale that we're gonna do a do a soccer game. So hockey was the natural because, you know, we were both uh, hockey fans and I grew up in Philadelphia in the 70s. So I was a huge Flyers fan and uh, I'd actually made a hockey game that that I had sold as a kid, a dice and chart based game. So between us, we really knew hockey pretty well. And that was a pretty easy decision. Let's do do hockey. And then I really wanted the NHL and NHL Players Association licenses for that. We were just starting to do license deals. So Madden didn't have the players. Time Warner was handling the licensing for both the NHL and the NHL PA. And I went to them and I said, we want both. And uh, they came back with, we can't give you the players. We can only give you the teams. So you know, I said, okay, well, I'll take the teams then and we'll use numbers for the players. When we finished our first game, NHL Hockey, we got the approval from Time Warner and we went to the, uh, the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs, so the finals, uh, Minnesota and Pittsburgh. And we're in Pittsburgh and we're showing the, the game in the media room and the uh, press is there and uh, John Ziegler, the commissioner of the NHL and all the NHL brass are, are, are sitting there. And of course we built fighting into the game and Time Warner had approved it. And the, the, um, some of the reporters had figured out how to get fights to happen. So, you know, they had number 99, Wayne Gretzky, like getting in fights and there's the commissioner and you know, he's not really happy and they're like judging his, you know, his reactions. And uh, so by the time I got back, you know, the NHL had said, you can't ship this game with 
with fighting in it. And we're like, you know, we've already ordered like $10 million worth of parts because you have approved it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to come out with fighting. And they said, okay, but, you know, not, never again. You can't do it next year. And, um, they, you know, they said, what, what would you like to do? Do you want the teams or do you want the fighting in the game? And I felt fighting was probably more important for the, for the game. Whenever there was a decision on, like, you know, how realistic should you be or how much fun should it be? We tended to go with the, the fun part of it. So for instance, the goalies are invincible because you can't push around a goalie. There's no refs in the game because that would impact the frame rate. So they're not skating around. So those are the kind of decisions that we made. You know, I felt like fighting was definitely a big part of the game. And in, in fact, when we programmed it in, you know, we had a very sophisticated system where if you were delivering checks on the stars of the other team, like the enforcer would, you know, kind of pick some of your better players out and, and try to get in a fight with them. And fighting actually mattered. If you, if you could knock out a guy, you could knock him out for the period or for the game. So there was a, a goal in getting into a fight and it was strategic. I didn't want to pull that out of the game. So I went to the NHL Players Association. I told them, you know, we tried to get you guys and, and uh, you know, and Time Warner said no. You know, they actually sued Time Warner because they had never heard of this. They're like, this is the first time we're hearing about this opportunity. They said, as long as fighting's realistic, you know, we'll let you put it in the in the game. They said, look, we'll, we'll do the license just make the number of fights that happen be like the normal amount that would happen in a game. It's like 1.7 in a, in a game. So, uh, so, so I said, okay, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that. You know, the NHL wouldn't be a part of that. So they basically, they didn't have the license for the, for the second game. And it was NHL PA 93. And that was tremendously successful, even more than, the original NHL version. So we, you know, we're quickly making NHL PA 94. Then the results of NHL PA 93 are coming out and the NHL now wants like back in. At that point, we started to have a really sophisticated um, fighting system. We wanted the NHL on the game because it was starting to get more important with uh, CDs were coming out. We knew we'd need real footage and that was controlled by the NHL. So we didn't want to lose the NHL and we didn't want them going off somewhere else. So we had a great fighting system built in. We'd, we'd really enhanced it in, um, in NHL PA 93 and then 94. We ended up ripping that out of, of, of NHL 94, even though it was fully implemented, it's very sad. That was a really cool feature, obviously. You know, it didn't hurt the sales of NHL 94 not to have fighting in, but you know, fighting didn't come back into the NHL series until, uh, until 96, um, and, and I was no longer involved with it at that point. What's incredible about early computerized sports video games is that most of them weren't so much inspired by the real world sports they were emulating, but by these arcade and handheld toys that had established the gameplay long before microprocessors were involved. It's about time we met Mark Lesser, a guy who was so good at programming video games that he didn't let small things like, you know, not knowing the rules of hockey get in his way. I graduated with a degree in electrical engineering. Didn't learn anything relevant, but it was a you know, good education, I guess. Uh, I went traveling after college and came back, uh, no job. So I went looking for a job and bumped into Rockwell, which was kind of funny. I had long hair and a ponytail and Rockwell was about as straight a place as I could imagine. And I ended up going in there as a circuit designer on uh, BuzzFit-based designs and worked on 
handheld calculator chips and small systems. They had a couple of small uh, microcomputer systems. And then I think it was George Close and Richard Chang from Mattel came to Rockwell and gave him a proposal to convert one of the calculators into a handheld game. And my boss called me in and gave me some options about what I wanted to do. And one of the proposals was that proposal from Mattel. And I looked at it and I thought, well, oh, a game, that would be something. And then after that, I did nothing but games. That was Mattel Auto Race. Then there was baseball. I don't think the rest of them were sports games, though. So we had uh, Space Alert or Flash Gordon. Oh, and football. Don't want to forget football one, of course. So there were three. The basic rules are, if you think about what's in a game, you know, you, you eliminated all characters, no personalities, there are no players. There's no team names, there's no teams, you know. It's all just the rawest kind of baseball. It's like something, you know, that kids may have played when they were, you know, four years old and a lot. You don't know anything about the game. The kicker is in all these games that in order to make it intriguing, there had to be some hook. And the hook usually had little to do with the sport. So like in auto racing, it wasn't so much the idea of passing, it was more an obstacle avoidance thing, but how do you make that in interesting? Where's the hook? And the hook came in the tuning that it, had, it was a balance between predictability of where these obstacles are gonna be and how easily or more difficultly you can get in without getting stuck. Baseball is so simple. Look, if you think about the arcade games in those days, there was this ramp game they always had when, when I was a kid, I loved it. And basically, it was like a pinball game, but the ball would be pitched to you and you swung a little bat and hit the ball up ramps. And depending on how it went, it either went, you know, over the fence or into the stands or, or as a grounder, you know, like that. So the essential quality was there. This ca captured this to some degree. Baseball is the easiest sport to program, I think. So I met through a friend, Paul Narath. And he had a he had a Blue Sky, uh, I think Blue Sky Productions. They changed the name later. They got sued and changed the name, I think, to Looking Glass or something. But I went visiting him for about a year at his studio. He had some really bright people working there, a lot of MIT people. And somehow EA gives him a contract to do Madden 93. And there was nobody in his studio that had any Genesis experience whatsoever. And I'm thinking, you know, what is going on here? And so Paul is asking me, who's, he's never worked for, I've never worked for him. And he's out of, out of the blue, he's asking me to do, do you want to do <laughs> Madden 93? And I scratch my head, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah, I'd love to do it. But I'm, I'm, the, the thing I didn't say is you really think EA will trust me who they don't know? And you as no experience, you can trust us to do this game, but I guess they did. And they didn't want the game to be changed in certain ways. They really wanted to, you know, have it remain the same flavor and there were a lot of things in it that they wanted the same. They wanted basically to add features. There were a lot of uh, graphic changes. They wanted crowd being visible when you kick the ball and over the goalpost, which was the most difficult thing to do. I was finaling the game in EA in California, in San Mateo. And a member, a member of the production staff came into my little lab there and said, why are you working for Blue Sky? Why are you working for Paul Nareth? And I said, oh, because he gave me the job, you know. I don't know, I know, not a businessman. And then he said, why don't you work for EA directly? And so that's how it came to be. And, but I also felt bad, so I felt good they were giving me this hockey thing. And I asked about it, I asked around, it wasn't, it was a great game, people said, but it really didn't sell that much. I don't know anything about that. But and so I thought, uh oh, this is like a demotion. They're giving me so they're shuffling something off on me. I didn't have a studio. I didn't have anybody to work for me. I was on my own. So Doug White was the artist who worked for Blue Sky, and they assigned him to do Madden. And after EA approached me to do hockey, I, I sort of panicked and realized I don't have an artist. How am I going to do? And I thought of hiring Blue Sky to do it, but I, th I didn't think that was a smart move. So I went to Doug White. So EA stole me from <laughs> from Blue Sky and I stole Doug White from <laughs> Blue Sky. When we had a kickoff meeting at EA for hockey, once again, there was a big table, a lot of people around, the production staff. Jim Simmons was there, I believe. 
I think that's the last time I ever saw Jim Simmons. I don't think I had any contact with him whatsoever that I can remember any time after that. So he just dumped the coat on me. And then I, I was left with the decision whether to take that code and really revamp it, you know, tear out the AI and, and redo it. And I didn't think I would have time to finish. And also being nervous because I thought I had been demoted from from football. So I think, oh no, I, I can't finish late. So I, thought, I decided to use the code and just tear out the sections. I think now looking back, it was a mistake and I should have just rewritten it, but I didn't know that then. And over the course of the next several versions of hockey, I did tear out more and more. I didn't know anything about hockey. And my experience with hockey was limited to um, rod hockey, which I loved as a kid. And that's what I knew about hockey. I didn't know anything about players. I didn't know anything about teams. I didn't know anything about rules, nothing. I relied on EA people to inform me. <laughs> what do you remember about the features that were that were sort of like required? Like when you were having those early meetings, what was the type of stuff that they wanted to have in 94? Oh my God, they wanted goalie control. This one wasn't there. Um, that's pretty huge. What didn't they want? They wanted four player, four user mode, crowd, special crowd animations. They wanted one timers. Good choice. They wanted flip passes, season mode, shootout mode, and um, all kinds of visual changes, including I think they wanted to redo all the players as well. There had to be new ones also. You couldn't really improve the graphics that much, but you had to make it, make it consistent. And since we were doing new animations, we had to, for a lot of special moves, goalie, one-timers, so you had to make it consistent, so you might as well redo them all. Oh, and they want a reverse instant replay. And that's not hard to implement, except it would really mess things up because one of the hardest parts of, the, of this programming was hit detection for a number of reasons. The hit detection is loose goose anyway, and it wasn't tunable in the, in the previous code. So I had to really tear that out and redo it. It had to look okay in the instant replay. And, that, and this is the problem. You get situations like, like in one timers, one of many examples, the, the puck would be passed over to the guy waiting to shoot. And sometimes it would appear as if the, you know, the reflection from his stick was happening, you know, 10 feet away from him. <laughs> and it, it didn't look like that when you played the game. It was okay, but you're not getting every frame in the instant replay, so you're missing things. So. The, it, the hit detection had to be really tight and careful in certain circumstances, but not too tight. It was really difficult. And basically what you did is, what I did is I drew a sphere, a, a mathematical sphere around the points I was interested in where hit detection might take place. And that isn't just on the stick, it's also on different parts of the stick and maybe his feet and different on a player's foot as well. And then see whether the puck goes into this sphere. But if the sphere's too small, the puck would actually go through it and you'd never notice it'd be on the other side. So there was, it was really tricky, tricky stuff. And reverse replay made it worse because you could see a different angle now. And so things that looked okay on the front angle didn't look so good on the back angle. So it was, I don't think it, it ever was, it's not perfect, but it was as good as, I think it was as good as you could get at that point. So EA, the people there were pretty rabid hockey fans, a lot of them. They had become rabid hockey fans, and they were really interested in the individual players, and the ratings were a critical thing. I don't know, I don't know who Jeremy Roenick was. I don't know him when I met him. But the problem is, how do the numbers reflect themselves in players' behavior? Being on my own, I had to make decisions about how things should work and how they feel. And I would make those decisions, send them to EA, and then they would feed back. But the people at EA couldn't have known and didn't know how to tune it. They didn't know what, like they say, well, crank this number up one. Well, maybe cranking up one wouldn't do anything because the resolution of the ratings isn't fine enough to make a difference. And that's all on me. And so I'm busy tuning these numbers and figuring out what should it be like. 
not knowing what these players in real life are, <laughs> and then sending it to EA, and they'll they'll say, no, 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 this guy is he's not that good a shooter, you know, or something. He's not that smart. You know, I didn't know all the players in the NHL that well to tell you the speed and all that, but you know what? It was important enough to me to get it right that I went and I hired a professional scout, to Igor Cooperman, to provide all the ratings for all the players and all the lines and all that. So, you know, that level of detail in an early video game, you know, like the first one where you actually have the player names was just, you know, kind of kind of crazy. It was a nice time at Electronic Arts because the producer really was a god. And, you know, you could do your own licensing, you, you know, and, and there was actually a pretty sophisticated system. I don't even know if you remember the sound meter. There was logic that was based on what would happen in an arena. And the home ice advantage increased as you got the crowd louder and louder. So, so I loved, um, you know, building in these real features where it wasn't just the frills. It was actually, there was a strategic part of, of it and you were getting feedback like, What's the crowd meter at? Oh, wow, if I can get that higher, like I have a better chance of, of scoring or my guys skate a little faster. You know, I love going to that level of, of detail because I just, I always had faith that real hockey fans are gonna like figure this stuff out eventually and, and, and appreciate it. There were two internal factors. One was the kind of player awareness and what, how I implemented and what I did with that. Um, and then the other was a kind of game temperature thing. The crowd meter indicated, you know, the, the loudness of the crowd of sort of building tension. But internally, that was represented as a ten temperature variable. And that variable, I, I spread all over the place, trying to do what I did know about sports games and watching games, that it's the buildup the build-up, particularly true in baseball or football, but very much true in hockey too. And and trying to use that, you know, temperature of the game. For example, well, the, we had to pull fighting out. That's its story into itself. But if there were, had been a fight, okay, so if there was a board check, right, the people would get more excited and the temperature would go up a little. So all kinds of things, or if there was a close shot, you know, hit the goalpost, you know, then the temperature would go up. And you, you could hear it and you could feel it and the players would move sometimes a little faster or their awareness, I would just bump up overall awareness of all the players. They were like, they were. it was adrenaline. I should have called it that adrenaline. But I, think, I don't remember the name I used for that variable. But awareness affected multiple things. And um, a lot of it had to do with the aiming of shots, for example, or and the aiming of, of passes, but also in pass reception, it was, you know, you would, the calculation of where the puck is going to be was slightly, in effect, altered so that he thought the puck was going to, he was going to a spot that wasn't exactly right, you know, and depending on the awareness, that kind of thing. Then there was also a, a general sensibility of how many players around you you were aware of. So they, they, there was a map, picture of a big circle on the ice around a player and how big that circle was, which players he was aware of, like somebody passed to him, if they weren't in that circle, he was really, he would flub the pass up. And so that circle, the size of that, sort of the diameter of that circle was varied based on awareness. The larger the circle, the more aware. So there were a couple of things, you know, a number of things going on with that. For a person who wasn't into hockey, for me, the buildup of tensions, if I could feel it, if I could really feel it viscerally, then I felt that that would make a fun game. That would you know, be good. And I tried to do this as much as possible. And EA helped with that too. Of course, you were giving feedback, what worked and what didn't work. But it was subtle because there were a lot of things. This is deep in the program, but I'm even altering the spheres that determine hip detection that I talked about before. And I'm altering those slightly because I, I want things either to become easier or more difficult, you know, so everything, this was scattered all through the program. If, if all the realistic things in the game, and that is because the players all get excited on a team or both teams or whatever, and their adrenaline goes up and things happen and kind of in unison. And you see that, you know, fights break out more often. And, 
that's why I didn't want fight to be fights to be eliminated. Not the fact that we spent a lot of time with it trying to improve it and Doug did all the animations and you know we had to cut it out. That wasn't fun. Um, but the, it was also the idea that that really added to the tension. You know, it was a kind of perfect release for tension. You know, you had this. Yeah. I was worrying that things are going. But instead of a goal or something, a fight broke out. <laughs> Just like in real hockey, you know. This is like the stuff of myth, right, uh, Mark? Because there's the you know people say like, oh, you could like there's blood, or you could like pull the jerseys over their heads. What 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 did you actually change in '94 that we never got to see when it came to the? Fight? Yeah, we had a, we added a whole bunch of moves. Uh, the the um, I don't remember them all, but I mean, pulling the jersey over the head was one that kind of thing. I think there was some ground action too. I don't remember if it's some kind of wrestling or headlock or something. I don't know. Uh, and there were the, the punches were. were altered, you know, there was a, just a whole set of the kinds of things you don't like to see at home. Well, maybe you do like to see, I, I don't like to see it at hockey games, but I also played around with the motion of them. So when you, a player got hit, the way he reacted to that with not just falling down, but you know, something else like you're bouncing off the other guy or that kind of thing. And there were several different kinds of punches, you know, it's kind of a boxing element to it. Um, but I don't really remember all the animations. I, it was a traumatic experience working on that and then tearing it out. That was, like I said, not fun. Yeah, was that a very late minute call? As I remember. Yeah. After we had done it, after we'd done all the work. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, we had some really cool um, fighting and, and you know injury stuff that we had in '94 that. Um, had to unfortunately come out because you know as we progressed and it got more popular you know the nhl wants to protect their sport and their brand um it made sense i, I wish we still had some of those old roms around that we could put on an emulator or something like that just to do like a, a retro but yeah that stuff uh long gone the thing that was great about testing back in those days was like you basically got paid to break the game and tell them what you liked and what you disliked I think the first game I ever worked on was like Tony La Russa baseball or something like that on the Sega Genesis. <laughs> As I started to get familiar with those teams and the people working on the sports games, you would get assigned something else. And I remember telling them, you know, oh, in my interview, the reason that I wanted to go and work at Electronic Arts was because of the hockey game, right? Like me and my friends play it all the time. It was really just a culture of people that were into sports, into wanting to bring those fun things about sports into our games and have it feel like you were in control of what was happening in those you know arenas and play fields and, and stuff like that so it really was just this really cool atmosphere of trying to break the game trying to tell them what you liked and disliked and um, it's still probably one of the best jobs i think i've had throughout my career a team of assistant producers associate producers producers testers that all sat in the same area right and we'd all be working on different things but we would all take time out and we'd play nhl right everybody played nhl it was very competitive very uh you know you wanted your voice heard you wanted to debate with people about what was working what wasn't working even if you were working on something else toward the end of the day or at lunch you'd have time to to put in on nhl and i think it was really like how how do we improve upon you know that that first one and then it was nhl 93 and there were always little tweaks and I think like the best thing working with Mark is there would be a period of you know all of us kind of compiling our notes and there was obviously a, a lead on each product whether it was the Genesis or Super Nintendo uh, back in those days and they would compile it and they would really champion the best ideas but everybody had kind of an input on what was working and what wasn't working. We'd go through a lot of the design changes a lot of the you know putting it the, the base game together and then we would play the heck out of it, right? And we would just continually pound on it and see what was working, what wasn't working. And then there'd be a period of time that Mark would fly out from Maine. And that was always exciting, right? Like, you know, there'd be continual hourly trips down to Mark and saying, oh, look at this thing that I found. Oh, and this is the thing that I want to do now. And wouldn't it be cool if we did this? And Mark was always just a sponge for those ideas. He wanted more. He wanted to make it the best that it could be and continually sought our feedback for that. So it was a really cool time to 
actually and, and back then it, you know the teams were very small so anytime that you got to spend with somebody um especially the lead programmer it just felt like your feedback and your passion for it was having a direct impact on the game a good part of every day for sure was um was playing the latest version of the game because we get a new version every day and then we'd hammer on that on that version you know different people would find different things our testers were were very good and you know they were very professional and so all of us played played a lot every day this game was written the old-fashioned way it was a big game loop and it wasn't it wasn't object oriented modern code is object oriented this would have been a perfect game to do c plus in c plus plus it, the, the way it's organized is is a much much cleaner for multiple player games like this so it would have been easy. You send a message out, and then each player responds. But instead, this was a game loop, and each player had his little stack of states. So th this is how the AI was organized. And so let, let's say you're in a state of you know skating towards an object. He has to skate over there towards the puck. He's skating over there, but suddenly something happens. You know the puck gets hit by somebody, and the puck's way back. He has to change his state, and so there's a stack. And you actually stack these states, and then when one state is finished, it brings up the previous state, the old state, and so you have that to reference. And that's the way it worked. And it doesn't matter how many how many players there are, so much as the kinds of things that were happening and how they interacted. For example, a one timer, which is a coordination between two players and the puck. One of the best features of NHL 94 was the addition of one-timers. That's when somebody passes you the puck and you instantly take a shot into the top of the net. Now, I'm going to demonstrate that right now. I've never actually played hockey before. That wasn't meant to happen. <laughs> one-timers were a mess. You know, you would have it to where you would pass through and the animation guy would hold up his stick and he'd get stuck there. Or you'd get the pass and it would go right through him. But it took a fair number of weeks to actually tune that and get that working in a, a way that it actually turned out really, really, I mean, I still think it's perfect. <laughs> like, it still feels like one of those satisfying things when you pass and you do a one-timer in NHL 94, you're just like, it has that feel, right? As a gamer, as a player, you're like, oh my God, they nailed it that's that's one of the credits of of mark was that you know we were so passionate about it and it wouldn't work and mark always made something work for us right he would always figure it out you have to make sure that the players are in the right state at the right time before when passing you didn't know that there was no there wasn't really a pass reception thing you shot the puck if the puck came within some distance of the of the, another player's stick it would be grabbed by him or reflected depending on certain things. But, there were, but in this case, you had to tell the receiver that get ready, you're doing a one-timer. He was able to figure out the math of it all. And, you know, and Doug White, um, he played hockey. So, you know, he kind of knew the animations and he knew what we, uh, what we needed. And with his limited space that he had to actually make an animation, he was able to get us the right frames and were able to kind of lock the player in for, for the one timer. So, you know, very tricky, but, but from a gameplay standpoint, I think it was like, oh, wow, okay, this is, uh, this, is, this is kind of a bit of a game changer because now you've got a move that you can pull off, which, you know, it sped the game up. I just want to talk about the process for a minute here. With Not only was I working in coding isolation with nobody to really talk to about this code, um, and, but not only am I in program isolation, I'm also remote, really remote. And, and eventually I'm in, well, not that, in, in 94, and I was in Maine already, working at the top of a barn, and I was alone. I didn't have the internet, really, uh, at that point, so everything was sent you know, you'd send a disc to EA, and they would get the disc, and then several days later, they would give it to their testers, and they would try it out. And several days later, you got feedback. By then, I had forgotten what I was wanted to get from them. <laughs> I was working on other stuff. Other stuff. So um, very difficult. And uh, so that process of feedback was really, really difficult. 
these are teams of like, they were the only programmer on there and there might be one graphic artist and you know and and then I was playing multiple roles as a producer and designer and you know there might some of the games there wasn't even really a, um, an assistant or associate producer so it was a pretty small small group of people working on these games and as a result we were able to make a lot of changes at the last minute and some of those ended up being you know really cool stuff. I'm working in a barn Right. The, the, this is a 200 year old barn and the, the, the first floor you walk into the barn there's hay on the floor and the beams are handheld beams that have been chewed by animals and you walk in and then I built a little sort of high tech bubble in the loft and you climbed up the ladder to get up there and then suddenly you were in the studio you know and these guys are coming from you know it's high paced California ways, you know, high tech. And um, it was always fun to watch that and watch how they, they came to this. And it was really a sort of a metaphor for the whole contrast between where I and how I worked and what they were into. They were, I think they were a little baffled by what was going on. Let me, I want to mention something. There was a lot of questions about why Hockey 94 came out well. And since I programmed it, I also wondered. But one of the things was there was sort of magic going on in Maine at that time. You know, 1993, the U Maine, U Maine is a few towns away from us. It's in Orno. And the U Maine hockey team won for the first time the NCAA championship that year. And it, 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 this was happening at the same time I was programming NHL 94, all happening within a few miles of each other. Maine had kind of forgotten. I mean, hockey's big here. But it was they were never very good at it, and you know, and there was something going on. I just thought it was really strange that why would this hockey game be produced here, and why would the U Maine team be winning that particular year? And I don't think there was anything to do with each other, but maybe maybe there was. Making games is hard, man. If you've watched enough of these no clips, you probably know that. So what's it like making a AAA annualized sports game in 2023? Does the shadow of NHL 94 cast that far? Or are there lessons that the contemporary team can take from that classic game? I definitely appreciate what those guys did back then, those small, those small teams, because it's like, I remember as a, as a kid playing those games and going like, you see the screen with like four or five names, you're like, is that it? Is that all the guys that worked on this? You're like, oh yeah, this, that's crazy. Um, so like kudos to those guys for uh, what they did. And, and in some ways I'm a bit jealous because it would have been awesome to work on like a, I've worked on small teams, those four or five person teams are, uh, you get some really awesome chemistry. For us, I mean, obviously we're orders of magnitude larger in this day and age than than back then. We're divided into sort of major groups. So we'll have gameplay group, presentation group. Uh, we've got an art group. We've got an online group, uh, game modes group. Um, and each group will be built of different jobs depending on what's what's going to be done. You typically have design across most of those. You have programmers or software engineers. And a lot of it nowadays is, is really making sure that each of the different groups are communicating. Yeah, we're definitely uh you know, 100 plus uh, across the board. And I know that that flexes, that can go up and down just depending on where we are in the development cycle. And then you obviously have the sort of EA support network outside of that as well, right? Like who- yeah, Absolutely, know, with all in. the partner teams and everybody else that we end up interfacing with, it, it goes well about that. We, we were having discussions this morning about NHL 25, 26, 27, and we, we've been working on 25, you know, a very small group for a number of months already. And one of the, the goals that Mike and I have is to buy back production time. So then we do have more time for our team to actually focus on the next version and iteration of the game. We're trying to buy back time so then we can ultimately build a bigger and better game each and every year. Our community has very high expectations year over year of what the what the game should have in it what we should be investing in and it's it is it's a challenge for us we're we're a we're a small team compared to the fcs the maddens and i'm sure many other titles out there so we have to make difficult decisions each and every year when it comes to where we want to prioritize 
our team what we want them to focus on and oftentimes we do consult with our community we want to, we want to understand where the greatest needs are what their wants are and does NHL 94, when you're ideating on the game and when you're thinking about the game, the game you're making is so much more larger and complex and, and is in a different era of NHL as well than existed in the 90s. But do you, is there any element of 94 that is sort of like in the background, be it like a pressure or be it an inspiration in some way for the ways in which you guys make the games uh, today? I would say so. I mean, I know there's... Uh, some fairly you know active communities out there that are still playing modding running esport competitions with 94 so i think you know I, I look at all that stuff very actively just as part of my my job and you know if anything you, you try to take that and go what is it about that game that, that's holding people still today and we talk a lot about um we're trying to make pushes to find a middle ground between um, retaining the depth that the game has now, but also looking back at accessibility. Games have become very complex over time. Um, putting a Sega Genesis controller in somebody's hands was hard back then if they never played games. Putting a PlayStation 5 controller in somebody's hands today that's never played games is, the reaction is like, no, 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 I don't wanna, I don't wanna be embarrassed. So I think for me, the one thing I try to think about is 94 was it was accessible. The reason we could get people into it, the reason why people play it today that aren't even hockey uh, fans necessarily is because it was just easy to pick up and play and fun. And so that in itself is something, it, it seems like it's obvious. I think you can easily lose sight of that when you're making games and get too fixated on too much simulation, too much authenticity, too much complexity. Um, and I will say like 94, it played like hockey. Right for, for, for what it was, smaller rink, bigger players, but it had good hockey flow, net scrambles, chaos in the crease. So there's a lot of that stuff that is just the true to the sport nature of the game is also something I think you, you want to respect and bring forward with you as we work on the series. The first Madden, I don't think it had a Nintendo version uh, or a Super Nintendo version, but then from that time on, we started to build out um, Super Nintendo versions and initially they were ports of, uh, of our Genesis version. So I would always do the initial design for the Genesis and then convert it. Um, just because for the most part, you could do more stuff on a Genesis back at, 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 at that time. People hadn't figured out the, the Super Nintendo and the CD version was almost like an afterthought. It's like, okay, we can add video, but you know, it, it was hard to make the video have an impact on gameplay. You know, and so we kind of went through a period when um, the first PlayStation came out and um, Xbox where, you know, all of a sudden the graphics are way better, but the gameplay isn't necessarily better. So it's sort of like, okay, um, the gameplay almost is taking a step back and yeah, it looks great, but if you're into playing the game, it's clunkier, it's not quite quite fitting. I told you, there. it's really subtle to get the tuning right. I mean, it can be wrong, 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 and then you get it right and you say, okay, lock that in. And I think gameplay, for the most part, took a step mm -hmm. back until it finally started to catch up um, later on. I worked on NHL 94, 95, 96, 97. So, and, and the thing that was always interesting was um, trying to improve upon the look, right? Like the player angle, like you could see it, the camera starting to, you know, the angle of it starting to shift up or shift down. And it's funny because once you start to introduce those little tweaks, just a little bit of camera angle or the skating animation, some of the feel starts to go away. I think we did a really good job on, on trying to deliver something new, but it's still like after all these years, like if I go back and I say the one that I want to play is, is still NHL 94. I think it's one of those, those magical come together universal things, right? The timing, the atmosphere, what was going on in, in the world, people's daily lives and, and being able to remember back, right? Like I still think about it with my buddies in college when. I didn't work at EA of like, oh my God, the fun that we had and that feeling that we captured, it's just a magical time to capture that feeling. And then being able to, you know, get hired by EA and, and work on the product that, you know, not only being a hockey fan, um, and, but being in that atmosphere of people that 
we're just having fun and you can almost you can still feel it you know what i mean so there's this this untangible thing of, of saying we captured the feeling at the right time we we all had a stake in it mm -hmm. and it was something that you wanted to put time in you wanted to put overtime into and you wanted to actually have this be the best possible experience not only for the people we were making it for but each of us that we you know worked with and competed against why do you think it is though that like whenever we talk about nhl of that era it tends to be 94 that gets brought up i have my own sort of idea of this but i'm, I'm interested in why you think you keep getting called up about 94 in particular <laughs> because it was main magic that year it was done in Maine, and and that, I mean, no, I I'm a, I think that the leap between '93 and '94 was probably so much greater than the leap elsewhere, in part. And the other thing is there was a um, a certain spirit about doing it, and I'm not sure why it was there that never really reproduced itself, and it had to do with the spirit of the team. And I don't know why, you know, exactly what that was, but it was just something. Something really clicked. And I will say that probably a lot has credit, the people that don't get any credit are the testers, but I really think their feedback a lot of times is, is a really critical. And it just some combination of, of people had a big effect. The number of, of changes, the fact you're going from a kind of toy-like game to a more, much more realistic game in a sense. NHL 94 is one of the best sports games ever made, a near perfect one-timer that sounded the horn and made the crowd go wild. But it's also a byproduct of its era, a time in which you could make fundamental gameplay changes and then test them out in just a matter of hours. And who doesn't want to be a sports hero in a video game? Especially when the real sport requires you to ice skate and use this huge stick and try and Score that, oh, screw this. I'm gonna go play my Mega Drive instead. You know, every designer and producer kind of has their own way of making the game and what they think are important. I left EA um, after the 94 game uh, to join Mark Lesser and we did the development of 95 together and then I was out. Like, you know, EA kind of just took it their own direction and, you know, people, decided to like change the speed of the game and the balance and you know we'd spend a lot of time tuning the game in the 94 version i think in general at that time it was taking about three versions three years to get to the real implementation so madden was the same thing where you know until madden 93 we didn't really get everything in so we knew there's stuff that we wanted in there that just we didn't have time to get it in this year's version, we'll get it in next year's version. After like, you know, the third version, then we finally got around to, um, you know, things like adding season play and stuff like that. But the, the early versions, the first couple versions of Madden or of NHL, you know, definitely had some, some weaknesses it is a little bit of rocket science and to, you know, to have a, a guy like Mark Lesser who, you know, is, you know, has a degree from MIT, that's pretty helpful in those situations because, you know, there are, there are a lot of elements where it, it is like rocket science. And also the fact, the tuning of it, I mean, it had a certain feel to it that is very hard to define because there's a lot of different things but it was, it was in there and it was the first time people experienced that. In later versions, since I was doing them, uh, a lot of that stuff was in there, but it wasn't new anymore. So I'm not sure, but that's, I still think it was the main magic that did it. It's fun though. It's a lot of fun. The, the stick part is similar to hurling, the Irish sport. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna try and take one of those fucking empty net, fucking goalie shots, you know? Fucking last, last five seconds of the game. Oh, fuck. Too much air. Burn, 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 burn,
Go 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 Wrist shot. That's it.